was a beautiful day. We were walking down. It was actually the first PTO meeting. So the two were in school, and I was taking him to the meeting with me when my husband called on the cell phone. And he got through the first time and said that he said it was a bomb because he had been there in 93 when the bomb went off. And that he must have said, and I don't remember this, he must have said, the windows are blown out and we're filling up with smoke because the two-year-old repeated it all day long. Uh, he kept saying, Daddy has no windows, Daddy has smoke, Daddy has no windows, Daddy has smoke. I was down at the school when they told me the first building collapsed. And I collapsed, as they told me. They had to pick me up off the floor, they had to get me out of the building, they had to get me home. Good evening, and I'd like to say it's nice to see you, but I can't. Like most of you, I have spent the last 20 months living basically at home, not going out. And I suspect, like you, I have come to have brand new appreciation for cloistered nuns. For purposes of identification, I'm Charles Gibson. My kids call me that old former TV news guy. But for purposes of this evening, I am, like all of you, a true believer in and a great admirer of the work of Tuesday's children. We meet, albeit electronically, in peculiar times, just as these days 20 years ago were singular and peculiar times. Tuesday's Children was born of those days and has stood the test of time, steadfast in its mission of providing support, counsel, and healing to families affected by 9-11. And during the past 20 years, adapting to the sad reality that there are new families touched by tragedy who need similar assistance. We've seen evidence of that just in the past two weeks. So Tuesday's Children has shown 20 years of resilience. The families it serves have proven resilient. And those who have supported Tuesday's Children, like all of you watching right now, have been resilient. And all of that, I must say, is inspiring. Tonight's honoree is General Stanley McChrystal, he was the commander for a time of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He is known for his candor, and it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say tonight. On a night like this, I think back to where I was when the planes hit. I was on live television with Diane Sawyer, taken completely unawares, as bewildered by what was happening, as was everyone watching. We've learned a great deal since then. Among the lessons that come out of the worst of times, can come the best of humanity. Tuesday's Children represents that to me, and you'll hear a lot about it tonight. After the events of September 11th, we knew that there was a gap to fill in services for the children that had lost parents. We needed to take these kids and get them out of their houses, put a smile on their face, and provide some comfort for the families. Initially, nobody knew how many there were. There were 3,051 children who lost a parent on Tuesday, September 11th, and we knew that they needed a special eye on them, a special group of people that would look at their well-being over the long term. So we took them out to special events, to picnics, to ball games, to lots of fun family events, even to Broadway. We also decided that there was things that the kids could benefit from, benefit from mentors, benefit from leadership programs, benefit from giving back to others. Now, with the youngest children in college, we provide career services for these kids. We will never take our eye off the 9-11 community. We are committed to them for the long term. In 2008, the 9-11 children came to us and said, we know we're not the only group of people that have been impacted by terrorism. We know that so many people all over the world have suffered a loss owing to terrorism or mass violence. So we began by bringing five different nations together, young adults from these nations for healing, for conflict resolution, skill building, and also to create a community of understanding globally. From different country and different continents, so we, we want to get to know each other pretty well. Her name is Caroline. <laughs> He, uh, she's from New York. Yep. Yeah. Stacky. Yeah. Otro. Otro. Cool. See? And, and the field? Okay. I don't have dog. <laughs> Sebaba. It's close. Sebaba. Sebaba. The v. Sebaba. V. Sebaba. Project Common Bond has now brought together nearly a thousand children from 34 nations. Acutely aware, you've all got a terrible 
common bond that you've all lost relatives to mindless political terrorism. I've seen some of you with uh, far apart New York necklace somewhere. I'm looking around. There we are. And I'm also acutely aware that the longer I bang on, I'm stopping someone from getting her birthday cake because we have a <laughs> birthday party for them. <laughs> It's an incredible program and unique. How we can take normal everyday conflicts and resolve them in a way that will make everybody happy. It's, it's nice to share experiences with other people, you know, they've suffered in a similar way. The other thing we do for these kids is we provide long-term support in the form of mentors, career mentorship, leadership, as well as programs for their surviving spouse. Tuesday's Children provides life management, financial management, and all sorts of wellness programs for the surviving spouse. The ripple effect of 9-11, of course, are our military families. Tuesday's Children is delivering its platform of programs now to the Gold Star families across the nation. Our military families of the fallen deserve the same support that we have delivered to the 9-11 community so that these kids and these surviving spouses can have the skills that they need to live a full and robust life. So the night of September 11th, everybody started showing up at St. Mary's Church because obviously there was a lot to pray about. Uh, the church quickly was filled to capacity and Monsignor McCann got up on the altar and said a few appropriate words and then he said, if you know anybody who's missing, because back then people were just missing, call their name out. And one name was called, the second name was called, the third name, and, and by the sixth name you could hear an audible gasp as the town was slowly finding out what really happened. When those people left the church, it was close to 40 names. So it was time for the town to come together and do something. So the following night, the town was gonna to come together and hold a candlelight vigil at Mary Jane Davies Park. And, and there were like 50 people there. And then suddenly there were 500 people there. And then there was over a thousand people there. And then they started saying the names again. Joe, Dickie, Andy, Friedman, and the 700 employees of Canna Fitzgerald. Michael London. Timmy Coughlin. Marty DeMeo and Daniel Callahan. Chief Jonathan Iovi. Chief Tommy Langone. And Chief Peter Langone. Michael Lomax, Farrah Judy, Ron Fazio, and over 300 of my fellow colleagues from Mayon. Police Officer Tim Roy. Peter Owens. Our coach, and my dad, Mr. Seaman. It's a beautiful service, and at the end, Reverend Jim of Congregational Church basically thanked everybody for coming and uh, said it was over. And there was one guy up front uh, who did not want to go home, and he just started singing the Star Spangled Banner. at the dawn's early light was so proudly we had at the twilight's last gleaming. And then one voice became a thousand voices. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of dreams and the hope of hope. That night, the whole town became a family. And family helps family. Hi, I'm Liz Urkel. I'm the director of the military initiative here at Tuesday's Children. I came to Tuesday's Children in 2015 when Tuesday's Children was embarking on expanding its community of care into the military families of the fallen. I myself am the surviving widow of Major Steve Zirkel, and my kids were five and seven. When Steve was killed by a drunk driver, at 11.30 in the morning when he was on his way to have a lunch with the kids at school. 
So I, I understand firsthand the challenges that our family members are encountering and the questions they have and the uncertainty that lies ahead. As a widow myself, trust was at the absolute core of anyone I worked with. I had to trust every car or every driver that my kids were riding with. I had to trust the schools. And and when you lose that partner and the love of your life, you question everything. Tragically for me, um, I lost my 20, she was 20 at the time, um, but she was a junior at Loyola and she was killed in a car accident. That was six years ago. Um, tragically for me, I also identify on, on a level with our Gold Star Moms because I also understand that loss. It does not make me uh, a credentialed expert, but it certainly does make me a person whose heart and empathy and awareness is completely identifiable with those statements that are never made. And, and my daughter grew up to be incredible. My son decided a late in his high school career that he wanted to go to the Naval Academy. I didn't know where to begin. And we were able to reach out to, to friends and, and to allies and to find ways, how do we navigate this process? I say with an absolute clear conscience to our surviving widows that my kids were really great and they have challenges and we faced them and they have so many more victories than challenges. Immediately after a loss, many people want to put a timeline on it. They want it to be, to be in one year or two years or three years and, and then we're complete, right? We're done, we're good. I think three years from now, I'm gonna be good. I, I remember being told by my therapist that I, that I plan to uh, grieve in a very efficient way and that she had to break the news to me that there is no grieving in an efficient way. But it is that concept of recognizing that you are entitled to desire better. I don't know a single surviving spouse who at some point after the loss doesn't spread, so to speak, all of the bills in front of them on the kitchen table to decide, can I do this and how do I do this? And not just because they are, are confused or ill-equipped, but because they have to get down to business. And I remember Terry Sears saying to me, Tuesday's Children is here to help answer that question of what's next. They have to know that we'll be there for them. And maybe they don't need us every day or maybe not every even once a month, but they have to know that when they need us, we'll be there. For the first time, you lost the one you loved. And it doesn't matter how long you've loved them. It doesn't matter how long you've known them. Your heart has been ripped out of your chest. It's very difficult. It's not every day that, you know, something like this really happens. And it's really, really, um, it's really sad. The best thing for you and for people that are going through this is to be amongst friends. And that's what programs like Tuesday Children does. It helps you continue. It helps you go through the depression, go through the anger, go through all those emotions while still being able to care for your children because there is no quick fix. It's a slow healing, so you need time to heal. And that's what you'll get, someone that will allow you to heal slowly. Tuesday's children, I feel, will be such a benefit for all women and men. It's about doing a lot of fun activities while healing. Doing yoga and finding mindfulness is more beneficial than just simply saying, you know, let's look at our wound. 
I loved the experience and meeting the senators was just amazing. They're really cool people. It's not every day that you get to, you know, meet a senator. I loved having a one-on-one -on -one with Joaquin Castro. Oh man, that was amazing. And I was just like, oh, I want to be a senator too when I grow up. The world really does need something like um, Tuesday's children. Let me help you get a job. Let me help you get a career. Let me help you get a path to healing emotionally. Let me get you a path on just, you know, let's find ways that you can get outside the house and begin to enjoy your life again. And it's not about, oh, let's go find someone new. It's about heal again and start the next chapter. Hi, my name is Joseph Green and I have been working with Tuesday's children for a little over five years. I've been working with them in two main capacities, one with their program Project Common Bond. There I have had the honor to work with youth from all over the world as an instructor, facilitator, and mentor. Additionally, I work with their actual mentoring program where I've worked with them to create a new, more interactive and up-to-date version of their mentoring program that exists primarily online now. And so those are the two spaces that I, I, I work with them. So there's two programs there. There's the winter program, which is sort of an intensive program where they bring about 10 young people from across the world together. And then there's the summer program where they bring a bunch more young people together from all over the world, all with that common bond of having lost a loved one uh, in conflict. I think anybody who pays any attention to what's going on in the world right now, there's a lot of turmoil. And I think that Rightfully so, Tuesday's children and, and Project Common Bond realize that if we don't invest in youth, especially youth that have been traumatized by these conflicts, that we may never be able to break the cycle. I think that often the misconception is that the common bond is the loss and Maybe that's what it is when they come to the space. Maybe the common bond is the loss and that's where we start the conversation. But no matter where folks are, no matter what it was that propelled them into that space, when they leave, the common bond is one of resilience, is one of being able to seek found family, it's the ability to once again be vulnerable and and make connections. It's the ability to, if you're there in your journey, begin to forgive. The misconception of being strong and being hard as a way to deal with pain is 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 in fact the exact opposite. Hi, my name is Mongene. I'm from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Central Africa. I came to the United States in 2018. I'm from a family of seven children, two parents. Um, my family faced a lot of insecurities, uh, whereby my dad was being, um, I would say, haunted or wanted or being looked for to be murdered over a piece of land that was left to him by his uh, dad and that was left to his dad by his grandparent. So, um, yeah, we faced a lot of uh, fears. We were attacked in our own home. We've been at gunpoint with my family. Um, we were forced to leave the Congo and move to Uganda to a safer place looking for a uh, resettlement. Uh, that was about 20, 2011. We became refugees. We did not choose to be refugees, but we were forced to be refugees because of the situation that we were in. We waited to come to the United States for pretty much seven years. Uh, life in a new country was a little different. We were raised speaking French. And then when we became refugees in Uganda, we had to learn English. That was quite challenging. Everything had to change. School had to change. Work had to change. Style of living had to change. Uh, we met good and bad people where we were. Um, 
it was hard for us to really cope up. We slept on the floor for very many years. We slept hungry very many years. Uh, even where we ran for safety, people still look for my dad, still look for my family. We used to walk about like eight to 10 miles to go learn English every day for a full year. And when we were coming back one day, we got attacked on the way by some people that were sent to hurt my family. And they took pictures of us. And when they were trying to take pictures of us, my sister got knocked down by a motorcycle. He lived in a hardship. I used to go to school. And at some point, I was we did not have enough money. I ended up not schooling my 9, 10, 11, and 12th grade. In 2018, in December, we were able to come to the United States. Um, my family and I feel safer here. Um, we are better, we're working, uh, we're going to school, I'm able to go back to school. So yeah, I, I, I think and I believe that um, coming to the United States of America was a, a very big uh, relief. 2019, I was able to be a part of the summer uh, conference of the PCB and that went very great. It went so amazing. I will never regret that time. Um, I made I'm, I made a bunch of friends. I made I think I made family. I call PCB my family because um, just finding people that you share uh, the same background, the same story, even if it's not exactly the same, but somebody that you share uh, pain and you know they know how you feel and you know how they feel it was a great thing. Uh, I felt like I was not alone anymore. I I felt very welcomed. I. Um, I just had a great time. I think um, it was a time that if I was told to do it, I would do it over and over and over and over and over again, just to um, get things off my chest, just to open up to someone, just to hear somebody else's story, just to encourage somebody else and, you know, strengthen each other and, and stay positive for the rest. I play piano to to, I don't call it a hobby. It's just a gift that I use to um, relieve stress off my shoulders, off other people's shoulders. And when I played piano at Common Bond, uh, PCB, it was um, it was just great. I just felt so great. And um, I was able to sing, I, I was able to teach them some of my songs that I've written. I was able to perform another song of John Legend, All of Me, I love that song. After that, I told them, that's how I feel about Project Common Bond, you know. They've given me all of who they are and I'm giving to them all that I am, you know. And, you know, just share the love in between um, them and me and every other participant that was around, so, yeah. Good evening, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is John K. Helen, and I have the honor of serving as the board chair to Tuesday's Children. Throughout 20 years of dedicated service, Tuesday's Children has served over 42,000 individuals and their families. Your support tonight will help us to continue to provide a lifetime of healing for those forever changed by terrorism, mass conflict, or mass violence. Offer a safe, supportive community and adaptive programming to meet evolving needs and be a trusted resource for families in the aftermath of trauma or loss. September 11th was 20 years ago, but the healing process for many of those impacted that day. And in the weeks, months, and years after fighting for justice for those whom were lost, still need our help and your support. Please consider making a 100% tax deductible gift in any amount you feel compelled and help make brighter futures for our 9-11 children, first responders, Gold Star families, and others impacted by acts of terror and violence please text TUESDAY to 56651 to make a donation now. If you'd like to call, our phone lines are open for donations, so please call now to 516-562-9000 or 212-332-2980. Or if you prefer, visit us online at www.tuesdayschildren.org for more information and to make a donation online. You may have noticed throughout the night a box in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Much in the way we've gotten used to looking at menus in restaurants, you can scan that code using your smartphone to make a donation now. Please help us support all those folks 
who are impacted by loss and trauma. Thank you so much for your support and have a great night. My husband, Michael Edward McHugh Jr. passed on 9-11, um, 2001. He was working for Tradespark in the North Tower. Michael approached me one day and I wasn't at all surprised that he wanted to enlist in the Army. We had spoken about it many years ago. He was interested in attending West Point. My father was killed in 9-11. Thanks to Tuesday's children, there was a lot of support there for me and some of that included the a mentoring program from West Point, which had a pretty big impact on myself when I was younger. In West Point mentoring program, it gave the kids and I an opportunity to visit one of the most prestigious institutions in America and the world. And the boys who the kids were paired up with were also very impressive. Uh, the mentorship at West Point was really awesome. I remember going and eating in their chow hall when I was God knows how old. It was incredible to be able to go there and see, um, just to see the school because it's so beautiful and then to interact with somebody who was actually going there because it's such a prestigious place to go. My mentor was incredibly helpful. I really enjoyed the time I spent with him while uh, while he was at the, at the school. Michael's decision to enlist was definitely an extraordinary situation. I was excited and proud nervous and anxious and I went through all of these emotions uh, on a regular basis. But, uh, he wanted to be a part of the Green Beret program and at the time I didn't really know anything about it and uh, him joining kind of led me to want to learn more about what that entails and wh what they do, what the Special Forces is about. I wasn't really happy doing what I was doing. I would kind of like look out the window and see people doing stuff outside, just hanging out and I'd be cooped up in a in an office for 10 hours, so I figured this would be, you know, the best time for me to go and do something like this while I was still young and still had an opportunity to do it. He felt like he needed to do more, and and I think the, the, the craziest part is, is is how humble he is and, and how respectful and, and almost like stoic he is. Uh, he's been a uh, rock for my family. He was he was only uh, what five five or six years old when my father passed away, and he immediately assumed the role of of, of helping raise uh, me and my brother. I think it's important because you know I was six years old when my dad was killed, and that has left um, uh, me and my brothers in a in an uncomfortable place. I guess since then. It's really not something I talk about to, to anyone. Him going through selection and, and, and that rigorous process, the, the super selective process that he went through and actually um, coming out strong the other way and accomplishing what he, uh, what he aspired to achieve was really special for him. I would never want that to happen to anybody else. I think that we should do everything in our power to prevent anything like that, any, any sort of large scale or any, any scale you know, terrorist attack from ever occurring again. Michael is in a very elite group right now and a lot of people don't understand what special forces in the Army is. We hear a lot about Navy SEALs, but uh, the Green Beret is the elite of the group and he isn't there yet. He has a, a long process with lots of courses to go through to excel in and it's very physical and it's very mental and it's very challenging. It's all incredibly difficult, but it's all achievable. He has everything that he could want in his life right here. He didn't have to do anything. He could have taken the smallest of steps and become successful. He has a long-term girlfriend. He has a loving family. He decided to go out of his comfort zone and do something very important. I think Tuesday Shields has given my mom and brothers the same kind of support and feeling that you know, you're not alone, there's people out there just like you that they've given me. And I'm a little bit older than my brothers, so I think I experienced a little bit more of Tuesday's children than they have, but at the same time, they always know that you know, Tuesday's children has been there for them as well. But Tuesday's children provides an outlet for kids who have had traumatic experiences or have, have had a, a gaping hole in their life that they avoid that Tuesday's Children helps fill 
by providing guidance on how to deal with these, these troubling situations. And like my mother said, how to go about day-to-day -day life. I just feel very strongly about this country. I want to do my part in protecting its well-being. This has been a wonderful experience for me, being a part of the military, and I'm very glad at the decision that I made. We are honoring General Stanley McChrystal. He has been a true leader in the war against terror, and he has been someone that the military Gold Star families and all of Tuesday's children look to as a role model and example of courage, leadership, and bravery. General McChrystal, on behalf of Tuesday's children and all the families that we serve, I'd like to present to you the Extraordinary Leadership Award. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And on behalf of all those families, thank you to the organization for all you do to people who so richly deserve it. You know, sometimes we see casualty lists and we talk about the number of Americans who have either been lost to terrorism or lost in combat, and they become numbers. But they're not numbers. They're individuals. And they're not even individuals. They're all the, the people connected to that individual, the family, the friends, the working comrades. Each time we lose someone, it's like ripples in a pond. I think it was T.E. Lawrence who described it that way, ripples of sorrow or rings of sorrow that go out. And not just sorrow, but impact. And so the reality is, every time we lose someone, we lose a little part of ourselves. But every time we take care of someone, maybe we put something back in ourselves. I've been associated with a number of Gold Star families and you say, well, they need you to show your sympathy and pat them on the back and tell them you feel for their sorrow. And that, that is all well-intentioned, but that's really not what people need. What people need is a sense of inclusion a sense of inclusion into a larger effort to help them move forward to maybe goals that they have or that their children might have or dreams that the family member that they lost may have had and a chance to carry those forward. They're part of society. They're not something that spins off because we lost someone. They are part of all of us, the network, the community that we still care about. That's what I think is most important, the idea that we all still are responsible to and for each other. Organizations like Tuesday's Children are necessary because we need to be reminded that there are people who need some help. We also need to have a mechanism to make that work. You don't want to once a year think about it and send someone a card or make a donation to something. If you can provide some structure, then suddenly the people who maybe need some help with education or travel or any part of their lives, there's a way to do that that is effective, that is efficient, although I hate to use the term. And it's going to last as long as America has armed forces. It's going to last as long as we are out in the world. And it should last as long as that, because the fabric of our nation and the connection between citizens taking care of each other should be enduring. We have a volunteer military largely, and you could argue that the people who we lose chose to put themselves at risk. But they went to war for one simple reason. We asked them to. Not me, Stan McChrystal only, but all of us. America asked our young people to go to war. They didn't go unwillingly, and we should be proud of that. But we shouldn't be unwilling to remember that because they did what we asked, we now have to do what they need. The unfinished business of their lives. We need to help get complete. We need to take care of the people and things that they sacrifice so much for. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I'm a senior program director with Tuesday's Children. I've been with Tuesday's Children since 2006. It's an honor and a privilege to be following General McChrystal. General McChrystal talked about how important it is to consider the fact that these families and the heroes that we've lost chose to be a part of this mission. Tuesday's Children is honored to be able to be a part of this mission as well. Our volunteers relate to that message. 
Our volunteers are agents of change in the lives of young people who have lost their parent in military conflict and service. It's important that we remember our volunteers are not compensated. They're not in the role of a parent or a therapist or a tutor. They're in the role of being a friend. They can walk shoulder to shoulder with these young people as they navigate their future steps, support them through challenges, celebrate their milestones, and really ensure that they come to this work with dedication and an open heart. Our families trust us through the intake process and beyond. We provide continuing education and continuous support and family community engagement with the opportunity for them to have lifelong friendships. These friendships are the core of what we do and the cornerstone of our programming in that we are able to see the resilience that can come from these friendships. The circle of care at Tuesday's Children could not be stronger in the stories that you're about to hear. Andrea O'Hagan lost her husband, a FDNY hero on September 11th. She saw the power of mentoring with her two boys who lost their father. We aligned her with Skylar. Skylar is a effervescent cheerleader who could not have been more enthusiastic to be put in the life of Andrea. Skylar mentions her brother, Connor. Connor is matched with Brian and Brian also lost his father. Brian's father was an FDNY hero who perished on September 11th. This work is something that we take very seriously because it is at the core of what we do. And we are so honored and privileged to be able to share the messages from this evening with you. I got into this program because when I was about two years old, my father passed away in the Navy. And, you know, it was hard for my family, you know, just to like, to lose a parent, to lose a loved one. So this program really helped with that because I met an amazing person who was just another loving figure in my life, which was something I had lost before. Uh, I lost my husband, Lieutenant Thomas O'Hagan, uh, on September 11th. He was a lieutenant with FDNY. We meet pretty much like twice a month and we do whatever and it's so fun and it's so enjoyable because we get to talk about things that we love, things that we enjoy and just learn and do new things together which I think is something really important that everyone should get an opportunity to do. She's just, she exudes energy, this girl, exudes energy and I just love that because I think I had that spirit and spunk at some point in my life. I feel like I've lost a lot of it. But I admire that and so many of her traits. Andrea, she's a very kind and loving and understanding person. Like, she's a very good listener and she's always there to listen to all my stories. Um, Andrea had lost her husband in 9-11, so that is something we do have in common, losing a loved one. Um, and we connect over that and also a lot of other things like Andrea and I are both pretty active people. So we constantly go on walks, we bike ride, and we just like to explore. We've gone to Coney Island just last week or the week before that, uh, rode the roller coaster. My brother, he's also gotten a mentor that he truly enjoys as well because he has trouble connecting with others and opening up to others. But his mentor, Brian, and him have really been able to hit it off and he's really made a friend out of him. I would tell people to join the Tuesday Children Mentoring Program because it's honestly an experience that I think everybody should be able to enjoy. To have someone you know and to connect with and then ultimately become friends with is something that's really amazing. And I knew I could be some help to a young girl. And who knew it would be this magical? One thing I enjoyed the most is the interconnectedness of Tuesday's children and how everybody seems like one ginormous family that is very understanding and very willing to help everybody and anybody and make it extremely enjoyable in the process. Well, I can't say enough. I mean, they've been there for 20 years for our families and many others, and I'm grateful they're now connected with the Gold Star families. Uh, military is very close to my heart, my nephew, Listed after 9-11 and joined the Marines because of the death of my husband. So he holds a very special place in my heart. And um, just meeting uh, Skylar and her family, uh, and I, I'm 
I'm just grateful for all the good that they have done over the years. Um, and I'm proud to be part of that special connection, that family. Call it family now. Hi, my name's Charlotte and I was matched with my mentor, Clet in 2007. To this day, Clet's still one of my oldest friends and I know I can always count on her for some great advice or fun adventure somewhere. And even though we live on opposite sides of the country, I know she's only a phone call away. I'm so grateful for having her in my life. Hi, my name is Brad. Um, when I was about nine or 10 years old, me and my mentor Brian were matched up through the program. And it's been an overall amazing experience on my end. Um, he would come down all the time. We just watch football or, or hang out or go to dinner. I have so many great memories from him. My name is Nicholas. In 2007, I was matched with my mentor, Jim. Some of my favorite memories are fishing, making model rockets, building a hovercraft, and watching movies. And Jim will always be a part of our lives. Hi, my name is Matthew Rita, and in 2007, I was paired with my mentor, Jim. Some of my favorite memories were going fishing, paintballing, and inventing our own games and playing them in the car. My husband and I first got involved with Tuesday's Children. Um, our daughters were very young. And it was just a way for them to, at the moment, they didn't understand. They didn't know my husband was that sick. And we hit it very well. But it was just an enjoyment for them, something for them to go to and remember. And it made memories, stuff that they'll have forever. But as they got older and he got sicker, um, they learned to bond and started to understand. And they had people to talk to. My mother is an amazing woman. Um, she has been through hell and back. Um, because her friends before my father passed were all linked with my dad, seeing them now is very difficult for her. So Tuesday Children gives her an opportunity to make friends who are actually going through the same thing, who actually know what she's going through, um, and it just offers her support. Nobody really related to losing someone in 9-11, but with Tuesday's children, they related to all of that. They were always there for you and they understood where you were coming from. My husband deteriorate as he got older. Um, people just don't understand how much even more intense that is to go through. So initially after my dad passed, um, I didn't want to go to anything because I just figured I would be reminded of 9-11 and losing my dad. Um, but when you get there, all the activities are very big distractors. Um, going and watching a hockey game or going and watching like a Broadway play, you're not thinking about what happened. You're just making friends and making more memories. Two Shoes Children has honestly really changed my life because if I didn't have them, I don't think I would have gotten through life because it's been really hard without my dad. You're gonna mourn, but there's also happiness waiting afterwards. It's gonna be hard to get to get through, it's gonna to be tough, but the organization has shown us that you can still move on and be happy and enjoy life and still cry at different times, but just, they made us smile so much. Tuesday Children is extremely necessary because there are so many terrible things going on in our world and most of them become overlooked within five, 10 years. Tuesday Children is still active 21 years 20 years after 9-11, and it's amazing. If I didn't have them, I would not be where I am. It helps remember all the terrible things that happened and make something beautiful out of it. And so that concludes our program. We hope what you've heard tonight will leave a lasting impression. There are so many calls on your philanthropic generosity these days. We just hope that Tuesday's children will be one of your priorities. For the mission, of Tuesday's children is far from over. Many of those who lost a parent on 9-11 are now having children of their own and passing on the legacy of grandfathers and grandmothers unknown to future generations. Families of 9-11 responders are still in need of support and so sobering, 37,000 American military families have lost loved ones since 9-11. So the need continues. The work continues, 
Tuesday's Children continues. And maybe, just maybe, next year, COVID will not continue. And so we can gather in person. And when I say, it's nice to see you, I really will. Good evening.